And this has led to the belief in the culture, which is only partially true, it's only a small part of the story, that overeating is driven by emotional distress or emotional trauma. And, you know, there's the classic Golden Girls episode where something happens to one of the girls and one of the women, and they say, okay, who's going to go get the cheesecake? And they go and they go to town on cheesecake. Um, and everybody laughs and, you know, but they're actually creating a habit pattern that's very hard to, to break. So emotions can be the stimulus that that sets the pattern off, but they're not really the cause or they're not the, they're not the sole cause. Um, so here are the complicating factors. First of all, there is that time between stimulus and response where usually the brain wants to justify why it's okay. Nobody could go through a breakup with their boyfriend without cheesecake, right? Um, yeah, the you, golden you, girls say so. Right. <laughs> you, you, you can just start your silly diet tomorrow. There's no reason you have to do this today. It'll be just as easy. Well, you can, you have an opportunity to disempower that justification and change that greased shoot, which moves from emotional stimulation to cheesecake. You can reduce that grease shoot um, and you kind of pour uh, sawdust and glass on it by looking at what your pig is saying. What justification is it giving? Um, and in this case, the idea that it'll be just as easy to start tomorrow, it's not true. The way that the brain works, if you look into this, that if you have a craving and you have the thought that says, I can just start tomorrow, and then you have cheesecake, you are reinforcing the craving and you're reinforcing the thought. So tomorrow, you're more likely to have the thought, I can just start tomorrow. And tomorrow, you're going to have a stronger craving for cheesecake. And so you can only ever use the present moment to be healthy. If you're in a hole, you got to stop digging. Right. That's an example of a rational refutation. That's an example of disempowering the excuse, pouring sawdust and glass on that previously very comfortable grease chute that you used to go down. Um, that can be very helpful in stopping intervening with that habit loop. Okay, so there's the rationalization. You could, you could think of that like if there were a fireplace around a roaring fire in the living room and the roaring fire was the emotional upset, your pig is poking holes in the fireplace with these crazy rationalizations and you can plug the holes in the fireplace so that it doesn't matter how strong the fire is as long as it's well-contained. As a matter of fact, that's actually an asset, not a liability. People gather around a fire and make memories and cry and laugh and hug. and, and um... yeah. So that's one complication in the emotional eating stream. The other complication is that when you have an emotion, there's usually a physiological component of that emotion. The psychologists that study emotion, they know that one way to define an emotion is as a physiological state of exc excitation coupled with a cognitive label. Um, so for example, both anxiety and excitement have the same more or less physiological profile, um, but they have a different cognitive label. So um, if you feel anxious, a lot of people tell me they can't get to bed without having a boatload of carbs because they just feel too anxious. And I say, well, did you know when you feel anxious, your blood pressure goes up a little bit and so does your galvanic skin response and your heartbeat and your respiration and your perspiration and, and you know, a lot of other things in your body that we can measure. And in animal studies, when they give animals a sugar reward when those signs are present, for example, they did this with baboons, and when the baboons demonstrated higher blood pressure, they gave them a sugar reward. That group of baboons, although the moment you give it to them, the blood pressure goes down a little bit. As a whole, their regular measurement of blood pressure went up on a regular basis. So what's happening there is that your body and your brain are looking for physiological states that seem to result in the acquisition of calories. So you're actually reinforcing the anxiety. You're making your anxiety worse by eating the carbs, not better. It's better for a very short short thing. This this happens with smoking also, by the way. Smoking brings you down a little bit, but it brings everything else up, you know, all the time, except when you're smoking. And so it's not just emotions causing overeating, it's overeating is causing the emotion also. So, so you got to break the pattern. One of the ways I suggest that people do that is to stop telling themselves that they're comforting with food or they're numbing out. Because, I mean, let's face it, if you if you were really just numbing out with food, then when you went to the dentist, if he was out of Novocaine, he'd say, let me just inject you with a bagel. 
right? Or give you give you a bar of chocolate. That's you're not what a donut. You, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what what you're actually doing is getting high with food. You're you're seeking an unnatural concentration of starch or sugar or salt or some other excitotoxin to overload the nervous system so that you can't process the emotions the same way. So you're, you're getting high with food. It's it's perfectly legal. You're not going to wake up married to your new husband, Bubba, in a cell with four gray walls because you you know had too many donuts. Um, it's a perfectly legal drug, but it's a drug. It's a drug, right? 